Lord's name, let us rejoice and be glad in it. I'm Pastor David Gordon. I'd like to welcome everyone to worship this morning at Bible Springs and to all those who will be joining us online later. Welcome. Um, there are many things going on in the life of the church, so I invite you to look at your announcements um, at your leisure. Um, I don't see Dawn this morning. She had asked me to make copies of the, uh, uh, what do you want to call it, gift card list. So I've got copies. Um, and, oh, there you are. Okay. Take that back. Well, I'm going to give her the, the gift card list. And I don't know if you want to say anything about it. Maybe they need to give them back to you. Right. right. It's written on the forms. It's just in a couple weeks. So we're trying the next week, if you have them, please bring them to me if you want gift cards, probably, and they will be in by the following week. So the second Sunday there in December, we're going to try to make sure everybody has them. Um, it says on the top, order due December 3rd, delivery by December 10th. So that could be a little extra time. But um, trying to get something if you want it for Christmas, if you got it. Um, same idea of what we've done in the past, so... It says on there, if you want to write a check at the bottom, I'll put the price of the stretch. That's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Also, uh, a week from Wednesday, we'll be starting our Advent study, so I will get a, uh, some instructions that link out next week. But I uh, invite anyone who's participating just to go ahead and read the first chapter of the book before first class. Um, I think everybody has their books at this point, though, so if you don't, let me... No, I have, I have one. It may be my card, not instead of the church, but I'll give it to you. Also, when it says, I'm oh. thinking about that, um, I'm going to talk to you about that. Okay. Just let me know, and I'll have forms. Okay. Very good. So, point said this, keep that in mind. Uh, any other announcements for the good and bad this morning? Yeah. Did you say Carl? Oh, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, there he is. He's just great. Yeah, I was going to say, he's probably home with me. But we know what that means, right? So, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Is that 21? 22? 22? 22? Oh, wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> Other announcements for the good of the body this morning. I invite you to stand in heart or spirit for our opening hymn, hymn number 154, while hailing the power of Jesus' name. And we're going to sing four verses verses 1, 2, 4, and 6.
be in our call to worship God in your bulletin. Our God is the plaster of the vineyard. We are the God is the God gives us all we need to thrive. Let us bear fruit according to God's care for us. Join me in our opening prayer. Nurturing God, may the roots of our lives dig deep into the rich soil of your love. Nourish us with word and sacrament, that we might be strengthened to carry your love out into the world in all we do and say. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. This morning we're going to do a very familiar Thanksgiving song that was words were written in 18, 1844 and the music was created in 1858. So it's been around for a while. We're going to do it this morning with some solos. Uh, that everybody would have up here on this. Pat, Carol, Jerry, and Esther. Come, be thankful people come. <coughs>
are writing a joke book, and I wanted to try out some of my new material. Are, are you ready to laugh? Yes. <laughs> I know Will tells a lot of good jokes, but I got some good ones today, too. <laughs> okay? Here's the first one. Why did the squirrel throw his clock out the window? He, yeah, he wanted to see time fly. <laughs> Get it? Clock out the window? Flying? <laughs> that was pretty good, Thea. So, okay, it's another one. Okay. <clears throat> what goes croak, croak on foggy nights? A frog horn. <laughs>
Now, you brother in Jerusalem, and then of Judah, go between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did you only that? Now I'll tell you what I am going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedges, and it will be destroyed. I will break down its walls, and it will be trampled. I will make the wasteland neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are the garden of his delight. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed, for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. Isaiah 11, 1 to 5. The branch of Jesse. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, the branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and of fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears. But with righteousness will he judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions to the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, with the breath, breath of his lips. He will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be the belt, and faithfulness the sad around his waist. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Jerry. The title of this morning's message is Reasonable Expectations or Sour Grapes. <laughs> Have you ever been evaluated by someone? And if you worked for a company or something, you've likely been evaluated at probably at least once a year in a formal evaluation. I was just evaluated a few weeks ago by the South Parish Relations Committee. That happens once a year. Students, and I've got some here. You're evaluated all the time, right? Homework, tests, papers that have turned in. And then even if you own your own business and never had a, a supervisor, you likely, whether you knew it or not, were being evaluated by your clients and your customers. In my business life, I had uh, I was able to evaluate many, many folks. Um, the way it worked at the firm was the person being evaluated, like we do here, um, prepares a self evaluation, a self evaluation, excuse me, and they turn that in. And then if I was the one writing the evaluation, then I would prepare an evaluation of that individual. And I found almost all the time my evaluations of the person's uh, of performance was pretty close in line with their own self-evaluation. So the, the meetings went pretty well. But I can count on probably one hand, probably on half of one hand, the times where what they put on their self-evaluation, they might be saying, exceeds expectations. Unfortunately, mine was more like, needs a lot of improvement, or is it meeting expectations? And I could always tell that those were never going to be easy conversations. It was a signal to me that either my expectations were unreasonable or hadn't been clearly communicated, or that the individual didn't understand the expectations or wasn't being held accountable by some of the, their other direct supervisors, the seniors or the managers throughout the year. And I think that's what we're seeing in today's scripture. You know, the vineyard owner in a reading today is evaluating his vineyard. And it starts out, surprisingly, as a love song. You know, let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. And you know, that probably seems odd to us, but in the Old Testament, love songs were a way of expressing the depth of God's love for his people Israel. 
And we hear in this love song how much God loved Israel. He found just the right place to plant that vineyard, a fertile hill, and he planted the best of the best vines, grapevines, in there. Before he even did that, though, he took the time to prepare the soil, to dig it, to remove all the rocks. And if you've ever been to the Middle East or the Holy Land, you know there's an awful lot of rocks. And he built a watchtower, and he put a hedge around the vineyard, and then a wall around the vineyard. He wanted to protect the vineyard from birds and other pests that might eat the good fruit. And he built a wine vat in the vineyard because he expected all this great fruit from which he would just prepare these magnificent wines. Such amazing hopes, dreams, and expectations. But much of the others the same frustration that those good vines, they produce wild grapes. Some translations call it sour grapes. The wild grapes or sour grapes, that's putting it mildly, because the Hebrew word is actually translated as wild grapes as machine, which means stinking things. The vines were producing stinking things. No wonder God is frustrated and disappointed. And out of his frustration and disappointment, he turns to us, to the readers, to the hearers, and says, You, you judge between me and my vineyard. So I ask you, are God's expectations reasonable? Or is it just a lot of sour grapes because God isn't getting what God wants? Your God expected his vineyard to bear good fruit. And that's easy to say, but what is good fruit? Clearly, God didn't find the fruit to his liking. But I imagine to Israel, or at least to its leaders and the elite, from their perspective, the fruit was pretty good. And if we just look a couple chapters before our reading today, Isaiah talks about how well the people dress and how the women had their hair all done up just right. How they wear rich robes and beautiful things and fine jewelry and scarves and headdresses and rings and so much more. Seems life was pretty good for the people of Judah and Jerusalem. But if we just read a few verses beyond the reading today, starting in Isaiah 5, verse 8, 23, God tells us he saw something totally different. He saw those who amassed property at the expenses of others, drunkards, slothfulness, persistent sin, lies and the truth, self-righteousness and injustice. I think the fruit that God was looking for was more like the fruit that St. Paul talks about in his letter to the Galatians, chapter 5, verses 23 to 25. What we call the fruits of the Spirit. I think there's a little thing out there in the vestibule. You know, the fruits of the Spirit love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self control. The prophet Micah said, He has told you what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Micah describes the good fruits as justice and mercy and love. God expected good fruit. Instead, God stinking fruit. Did God expect too much? Is God just being melodramatic when he says he's going to let his vineyard be devoured and overrun with briars and thorns and let it dry up? In a reading today, you know, usually in the Old Testament, when we talk, when we hear references to vineyards, it's a metaphor for Israel. But it could be a reference to any one of us. It could be God's church, it could be the United Methodist Church, it could be anyone in the world. After all, God created humankind in God's image, and He called us good, and He expected good fruit to come from us just as God is good. And it's interesting that 
founder of the Methodist movement, John Wesley, actually used today's scripture in one of his sermons, a sermon he preached in 1787. It's called On God's Figure, appropriately titled. And like God, Wesley was saying how high, how he had high expectations when the Methodist movement first started. He wrote that he saw the Methodists warm in their first love, magnifying the Lord and rejoicing in God their Savior, and asked how it wasn't reasonable to expect that they were a cho chosen generation, a royal priesthood. But in his sermon, he was writing about 40 to 50 years after the movement had begun, and he was expressing his disappointment with the Methodist movement just as God was disappointed with his vineyard. Instead, he found that the Methodist movement, he thought, was yielding stinking fruits. Wesley wrote, it brought forth pride, prejudice, evil, surmising, censoriousness, meaning love, you know, pleasure, judging and condemning one another, all totally subversive of the brotherly love, which is the very bad Christian profession. Brought forth hunger and hatred, malice, revenge, and every evil word and work. Fruits not of the Holy Spirit, but of the bottomless pits. And he didn't stop there. He goes on and brought forth likewise and many the grand poison of souls, the love of the world, seeking happiness and dress, and the pleasures of imagination, and in the praise of men. You that are rich in this world, that have food to eat and raiment to put on something over your head, are you not increasing in goods, laying up treasure on earth, instead of restoring to God and the poor all you can spare? Tough words. Is that us today? Is that the United Methodist Church today or Christ Church today anywhere? It makes me stop and think how would we prepare our own self evaluation today? How closely would it come to God's evaluation of us? Are we bearing good fruit, stinking fruit? Powerful and privileged people like most of the North American mainline Christian denominations don't like the thought of having to sit with God for an evaluation. And let's be honest, when things are going well for us, when we have food on the table and a roof over our heads, the children are doing well, and our investments are doing well, and we're enjoying retirement, it's easy to overlook whose needs greater than our own. I have to confess, I'm, I'm guilty of that too. It's one of the reasons why I like to go on mission trips, because it reminds me that I don't live in the real world, at least the world that most people live in. And we like it when God shares with us comforting words. You know, don't worry. God feeds the birds and clothes the lilies of the field, and if God does that for the birds and flowers, He won't do it for us, certainly. You know, our common drink is water, it's living water, and we'll never thirst again. We don't like to think about the fact that we're also told that one day, like Israel, we'll be sitting before God for that great performance review. Jesus said, He is the vine, and we are the branches. And if we, the branches, are children of God, shouldn't we be like God and produce good fruits? And we can't say that we don't know what God expects because we see it over and over again throughout the scriptures. You know, God places us in the garden of Eden to be with God and to tend the garden. But what happened? Sin and death. God told Abraham to have descendants as numerous as the stars to be a blessing and a light to the world. And time and again, the people turned away. God delivered his people from slavery in Egypt to begin a new life in a new land. And he gave them the commandments 
to, to guide them in their way of living. What did they do? Built a golden calf, an idol. The thing is, God is a jealous God. And he doesn't want just part of us. He wants all of us. Our hearts, our minds, our souls, our strength. God loves us so much. He doesn't give up on us. As much as we don't like to get evaluated, God is doing it for our good, so as to guide us in the way He would have us go. So why does this connect then between God's expectations and our performance? In our scripture, God seems puzzled. In verse 4, He says, What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? I think God already knows the answer to that question. I think he's asking it more for our benefit. Why do we think that it is? Maybe it has something to do with our human condition. It stands in the way of us meeting God's expectations on our own. You know, St. Paul said to the Romans, you know, for I do not know, he says to them, for I do not know what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. And I think of sin as being like that fungus that affects some grapevines. It gets in there and causes the vines to produce bad fruit. In our case, it produces hate and resentment and discord rather than love and peace and joy. God expects good fruits, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, gentleness, and self-control, faithfulness. Is it too much to ask? God expected justice from Israel. Instead, he saw bloodshed. God expected righteousness from Israel. Instead, he heard the cries of distress. You know, I think we would all agree justice is important, right? You know, when we're wrong, we expect justice. You know, when I stop to think about it, on the other side, the person who's done the wrong been caught, they're probably hoping and praying for mercy. When the evaluator and the one being evaluated are on that same page with respect to expectations and performance, the evaluation process goes pretty easy. But when they're not on the same page with respect to those expectations and performance, my experiences, those conversations are pretty uncomfortable, and it can be a challenge to live together going forward. But it's in those times, I think, it's important to remember that justice and mercy should be held together. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it, God asks. Well, our first reading that Jerry read from chapter 5 might lead us to believe that God is God's answer to that question is to give up in Israel. The reading from chapter 11 reminds us that that couldn't be further from the truth. Our God sees a relentless God. He doesn't give up on us. He sent Isaiah and other prophets to get them to listen, to see and perceive what God expects. Those prophets, they're still speaking to us today. God is determined to find a way to bring us back to him, even if it means turning our worlds upside down. The God of love does not give up on God's beloved. Maybe if they won't listen to my love song, I think he says, you know, I'll send a prophet. If they won't listen to the prophets, maybe I'll send my son, a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and he knows Jesus. God, the vineyard owner, does exactly that. He sends his son to the vineyard. It's all there in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's called the parable of the wicked tenants. And what happens? The other son is beaten and killed. God expected justice and righteousness and instead saw bloodshed 
her cries of distress. God has every, every right to demand justice. The punishment for sin is death. But God is also merciful. And instead of wrath, God shows mercy. And we see that in that intersection of justice and mercy in the cross. With God's Son, Jesus, there at the center of it all. Human justice demanded Jesus' death. Instead, Jesus asked for God's mercy. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. See, justice without mercy is cruelty. And our God is love, it isn't cruel. And yet, mercy without justice is, in, is inequity. So God, nevertheless, holds us accountable. Brothers and sisters, there is absolutely nothing we can do to save ourselves. There isn't enough good works, good fruit, that we can produce on our own to get rid of that stench of the bad fruit. It is only through Jesus, the good fruit, from which God prepared the finest wine poured out for us, that our stench can be overcome, removed, and have our smell, our fragrant decay, restored to what it was in creation. God has saved us through his Son, Jesus Christ, and that is God's mercy, that is God's grace. What a precious and wonderful gift. But it doesn't stop there. Because God calls us every day, every moment, every minute to repent and to turn to Him. He's saying, see what I've done for you. Hear my love song for you. Hear the good news and live in a way in Christ as a people fearfully and wonderfully made connected his branches to the true vine of Jesus Christ to produce good fruits, love, and joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, to care for the sick, for the poor, for those who are mourning, for the oppressed, to act justice, justly and love mercy and walk humbly with our God. Remember, my brothers and sisters, we have a Father in Heaven who sings a love song for us. And we have a Savior who was there at the beginning when the world was sung into being. Who even now hears our prayers and intercedes with the Father on our behalf. And they're expecting us to remember the help of the Holy Spirit, who we are, God's beloved children created to bear good fruit to the glory of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now we come to that time in our service when we lift up our joys and our concerns and how we see God active in our lives and the world around us. So I invite you at this time to share with every God has a place in your heart. So Lala's not here just because she was entertaining family at home. Um, we did a 80th birthday party for my dad. His birthday is not until the 29th, but we were doing it early, so we celebrated Carl and Dad <laughs> yesterday. So, um, so thankfulness that we had a beautiful day and nice time with friends and family for his birthday. And then Mom wanted to make sure I mentioned Kathy Woody, which is a neighboring person who has leukemia that we're praying for. She's going through a rough time right now, so keep her in our prayers. We're very thankful that Amelia made it safely home from Texas and she'll be with us all this week. We're enjoying getting to spend time with Um, a praise for um, my friend Debbie, whose son Brian found out 
last week that he had cancer in his liver. So it turns out it's, um, it's two little spots. Um, but the doctor further explained that it's really only 1% of his liver. So they are um, going to have faith and enjoy Thanksgiving, and he has surgery for removal of those two spots on the 30th of November. So praise that it's not as bad as what they initially were led to believe, and then uh, prayers for his upcoming surgery. Everybody, a very happy Thanksgiving with family and friends. The weather is nice. Astro doesn't want any snow. <laughs> and also, I'd like prayers for my granddaughter, Skylar. She's going through a rough time right now. There's going to be a lot of changes in her life, and she does not go well with change. <laughs>
and a Janus. Um, any other joys or concerns or God studies left up? She's like, I think in her new normal, as I call it. I mean, she's pretty good on the you know, three days a week dialysis. So. Thank you. Let us prepare our hearts and minds to go to God in prayer. Let us pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. God, who plans and tends us, you have given us all we need to bear the fruits of your justice and peace, and yet we stubbornly refuse to follow in your way. Do not abandon us, but continue to nurture us in our growth towards you. God of justice, in mercy, hear our prayer. Give us wisdom, give wisdom to all who lead at any level, Lord, that they might be careful stewards of the communities they serve. God of justice, in mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, strengthen all who journey with long term illness, those who are in need of recovering from surgery, the people who care for them. We especially remember those who we've lifted aloud this morning and those that we hold silently in our hearts. Pray for Brian, Skyler, Kathy, for the Reese Snyder family, for Howie, Maria, Susan, for Brock, Carol, Gail. We ask your traveling mercy upon all those who are traveling this holiday season or who will be traveling home later in the week. We pray, Lord, that people experience the joy of family and friends this holiday season. We also pray your peace for us with those who find it sometimes a struggle when they're around others. God of justice, in mercy, hear our prayer. For all the saints who tend to grant gardens and green spaces with love, we give you thanks, Lord. May we care for all growing things and grateful memory of them. God of justice, in mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful God, we turn all these things over to your tender care, trusting that you hear and answer all our prayers, both spoken and unspoken. Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Now we pray the prayer of prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but to deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for and Amen. Peace the Lord be with you. I invite you to turn your neighbor and exchange signs of peace and reconciliation.
And so at this time, I'll ask the ushers to come forward and uh, for Merlin to share, share some of our musical talents and gifts with, uh, gifts with us this morning.
Now's our time to gather the to the close. We're going to compare the world to the world. Go into the world and remember how much desire to be here and to act justly, love and mercy, and to share the love of God with one another. Until we gather again in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be amongst you all and remain with you all. Amen.